first of all, do you want to introduce? Want me to introduce myself? Okay, fine, Bridget. We can do this oh the my right goodness. way. Yeah. So I'm Bridget Stryker. I'm the director of the Archive and History Center at the Boone County Public Library. And I had come in in September and we had been talking about the Underground Railroad and we had been talking about early African American history here in Gallatin County. Um, Boone County has a extensive program that we've done we have an extensive database and we've been doing an underground railroad bus tour for many years since 2014 mm -hmm. and so we thought it'd be great if we could start looking at gallatin county because there is a lot of common family between both boone and gallatin county the boundaries were uh, a little uh, fuzzy back then lots of travel up and down the river so it made complete sense to kind of look at your underground railroad history as well here in Gallatin County well and also too on that is the I mean until recently Boone County was relatively a small population to like the last you know at the it was a hundred years ago the population difference between Gallatin County and Boone was not that was was not significant at all right. so even as late as the 1980s you had 50,000 people in Boone County right in total so if you you look at the the amount of square mileage it was probably very close to the same mm -hmm. um, as far as the population how it was dispersed and there was a very similar culture between Boone and Gallatin County where it was agricultural. And as a border river t river community, the conflict between Free North and Enslaved South was very real in Gallatin County. So when you got started on this um, and looking kind of at these stories, how, how do you do that? What's your process for l learning the past? So the process for learning the past is really at first when you're like looking at newspapers, you're literally just doing a, a general search. Gallatin County, escape. Gallatin County, slave. Uh, Sparta, slaves. And you're, you're doing general searches and just kind of casting your net out there and seeing what you can pull back. So we're looking at newspapers from really all over the country. We're looking at escape ads, things like that, um, as early as possible. Here in Gallatin County, the earliest we were, we were able to find is 1811, which is pretty early. What you had going on in those early years, you had a lot of people um, looking at the river and patrolling the river. We had a lot of early river patrols, both in Boone and Gallatin County. Because even that early, you were still having escapes north. Okay, so by you said river, now who's, who are the patrollers? The who's patrollers are uh, usually the slaveholding men in the community. So they just gather up people and the just... People volunteer, they take time. In some cases, they may receive a small uh, stipend or salary from the county government. But it's, it was in every slaveholder's best interest to participate in in these patrols so but they, they were definitely looking for enslaved so they would work together the slaveholders but it there wasn't the apparatus it wasn't the county sheriff going out or in in some cases it could have been you okay. had justices of the peace early on so it could be that they were they were gathering volunteers or it, it was very similar to how the counties operated like you had people who surveyed the roads you everybody was responsible for paying for the roads to be surveyed for in, in front of their houses or from one point to another very early on it was it was a collaborative effort in governing the county so it was a little bit more nuanced than here i'm going to pay you thirty dollars you know go look there were definitely people who were paid all through until the Civil War, but it was almost like being a mercenary if you were if you were a slave hunter, just because that was like a side income, and really that was generated later on. So probably after 1840, uh, through the 1850s, when you had the, um, the the different acts in place to make sure that the federal government was like, okay, you know, the Ohio River is a sieve and we need to shut this down so we want everyone to understand that if there's an enslaved person who escapes they are still they're they're required to be brought back to their slaveholder even if they're found in a free state so it was getting to the point by the 1840s there were so many there was there was so, so much many they had there to incentivize so it correct to correct 
what um, here in, in Boone County, what we were able to find is that we found well over 100 well-documented escapes from northern Kentucky and of course Gallatin County was a part Mm -hmm. of that so we were looking at Boone County and we were able to anytime we found something from another county we saved that information as well knowing that we would need it eventually the whole northern Kentucky area was very active to the point where there were large groups in 1847 there was a uh, uh, several escape attempts where people were leaving from Kenton and Boone County, uh, 18, f- and they were making up their way to Michigan, and they were living in free um, communities of helpers mm-hmm. for the Underground Railroad up in like Cass County, Michigan, and a large group of slaveholders with catchers and and a whole group went up there in a raid to try to bring back all of their enslaved. Like they literally went up with several wagons just to try to round everybody up so it it, as time went on and gallatin county was a part of that where there was more and more conflict related to the freedom freedom seeking activities the escape of the enslaved so your research breaks down kind of into two parts as far as boone and in this case gallatin county in that one part is kind of a migration route or a, a you know a part, part, a route yes. just on its own from yes. other parts of the United States, but then the the uh, the actual slave population that was active in these communities. Exactly. So um, we have a situation where you know you you would read a newspaper article or an account, even you know uh, slave narratives for former enslaved who who talked about their stories later on after the Civil War. They would talk about going through Northern Kentucky or going through Boone or going through Gallatin on their way from somewhere else to the north but because there were enslaved populations here now the populations here were significant but smaller right so they still represented 20 percent of the entire population of any given county like in Boone County it was like 20 percent 23% of the entire population of Boone County in 1860 was African American and all but 45 were enslaved, right? So it's the same sort of formula that you have here. Most farms in Gallatin County, like most of Northern Kentucky, were smaller. So it's not like you go down south where you have 200 African American enslaved people. No, you have maybe 10 you know, a large farm, maybe 10 to 15. You'll have a situation where you have a large family and they all own a handful. They all, all hold a handful of enslaved, but they all come together during certain times of the year, a uh, planting, harvest, when they're slaughter season, things like that, where then the dispersed smaller groups of enslaved come all together and then work for one particular family project. There are some cases where some non-wealthy families have only one or two enslaved. So the population was more dispersed, but it was definitely, and it was more of a personal interaction between the enslaved than something that you would have down on uh, a large plantation down it, south. It wasn't far off. You you people everyone kind of knew each other oh, as, as, bo- was, both it ways was, it was an it was an intimate relationship okay. so and i don't mean a good relationship right, right. but i mean that you had the slave holding family and right out the back door was the cabins for the enslaved people you didn't necessarily have an overseer you right. know it was something where the slaveholder may work have worked directly with their enslaved and they may only have like three men who were helping and they may have had a, a whole family with them and so then the the the, the mother um, and the children may have helped in the household or around the house yard with 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 the family's kitchen garden and things like that so it's just a different concept than of the the, the plantation and South Carolina, that would be its own thing unto right, its own, right, right, on right, massive right, acreage right, and right, stuff where like it was that. an entire community of enslaved people. Right. Here in um, Kentucky, generally the Baptist churches had an enslaved membership, and so that provided an opportunity for dispersed enslaved to kind of come together as a community. But we find that it also offered an opportunity to possibly plan escapes. 
so um, to coordinate some activities in a way that you um, you wouldn't get if if everyone was more remote, if that makes sense. So when you're doing your research um, on Underground Railroad, how how have you been able to or to f- to figure out the people who were helping? How like looking back and on records and information, how are you all able to look and go? This person was an abolitionist, and this is what they were doing. So it's really interesting, and you need to look at your community, and by community, I mean the entire county, as one big puzzle. It's a jigsaw puzzle. So you look at the trends. So you can go in the 1850 or 1860 census, and it will list every single slaveholder within the community, and then you compare that to their neighbors. Do their neighbors own enslaved or don't they? So you can you can see clearly in enslaved properties versus uh, properties that may have have abolitionists on so, them. So if you didn't have a, a slave on your census, that that was a kind of a you were almost kind of announcing at that point. You are announcing that for for whatever reason. Right. But then in this area, there's also universalist churches. Okay. Universalist churches were abolitionist churches primarily. And they were kind of sprinkled all along the river. And like if you look at Florence, Indiana, right across from you, what we would do is we would look to see the structure of who lived where along the river in comparison to who lived on uh, the Gallatin County side. You can then see who associates with one another. So maybe you have someone who was living on a property, they didn't hold in slaves, and their daughter married someone from the Universalist Church to cross a river. Well, that's kind of like a red flag mm-hmm. that that there may be more of an association. That, that gives you a, a, a cue of where to start looking. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so we look at church memberships. We look at who's marrying who. And if, if you plot out individual properties along the river, sometimes you get an idea of, okay, this person is suspected as being a helper because you know the slave catcher the well-known slave catcher brought, bought the property right next to them so somebody is going it's almost like a big chess game mm-hmm. where okay i'm on this property and i'm a helper this is a perfect place but i've been too suspicious lately so you know george brasher the the famous uh, slave catcher he is he brought a property right next to me and he has someone living there watching me all the time and watching that particular river crossing what would happen after the the 1850 fugitive slave act everyone was compelled to be part of a slave catching group if deputized so what we saw was some retaliation against some of these abolitionist families by a slave escapes you know an enslaved person escapes across the river or suspected to have escaped you are thought of as someone who with who may participate in absconding, mm-hmm. right? So then the slave catcher will deputize you to go f- and force you to go help try to find this enslaved person. So there was active retaliation against the abolitionists within any given community, which really led to a lot of extra social stress within the community and, and longstanding resentments. You know, I, I in Boone County, we look at some families who don't get along or all of a sudden there was some serious legal, like they were su- lawsuits going on and it sometimes goes back to pre-Civil War and related to some of these activities, right? Um, uh, the communities have a long memory, mm-hmm. right? If you look at Gallatin County, it's not large, even when it was there was still part of of Owen County still connected, right? It was a small community. Everybody knew each other's business. You look at any small town; everybody knows each other. Everybody knows what's going on with each other. It was the same back then. But if you had an enslaved person who escaped from your property, who are you going to look at first? You're going to look at your abolitionist neighbor, <laughs> right, right? right? Okay, all right. How did you help? Okay, Matt Bates, what's going on with you? You know, you all had a story, um, I believe it was 1851? No, 1838, where you had Lewis Hamilton, who was a uh, free person of color, also known as free blacks. So you had 
African Americans who were freed who stayed within the community mm -hmm. after they were manumitted for lots of different reasons. Sometimes they're older, so you have the families like, okay, you're not, you're not really working to the capacity we would like you to. So they'll manumit them. Were they? Was that because they did they have to pay a tax or I mean, they did have to pay taxes. They absolutely paid so, taxes. So is there? It was in their financial bet. Right. It wasn't. It wasn't like some great, kind-hearted soul. They were. You were costing me no. money, so now you're right, on your right, own. Right, 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 right. Economically, it was better. Now, and that's also you can go every single year for Gallatin County, mm -hmm. and look at your tax records for every single year, and there will be a column. Well, there's a few columns that talk about all of the enslaved, and then the enslaved over a certain age, like males over the age of 16 and then everybody else. Mm -hmm. So you can tell how many slave people someone has, but you can also see if there was a particular person who had a um, escape, how many escaped. Like, uh, I mean, every once in a while you'll have, you'll have deaths, of course, and births, so that changes your numbers a little bit. But if you had a, a young male, a, adult, male and slave person, then, and all of a sudden they're not listed anymore and there's no, it doesn't look like they were sold, right? And they're listed as, let's say uh, a certain person, Mr. Ayers, you know, lost an enslaved person. Um, then you can look at all the Ayers and go, oh yeah, it was Thomas Ayers, mm -hmm. right? So you can then pinpoint exact enslaved who may have escaped and, and look year by year by year. So again, that's a very, it's almost like it's a microscopic view of your community, but then you blow it up to look for everybody, right? So you're looking at all of the records to get this, this very detailed view of your community. So that's kind of where we're starting with Gallatin. We're starting with the escapes and starting noting those and noting the patterns. But then eventually what we can do is we can look at everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And then we can get down to the nitty gritty details of exactly who was enslaved by their name, who they were enslaved by, whether or not uh, when they were born, when they died, potentially where they're buried here in Gallatin County. Um, we can track them through the migration periods moving forward. One of the things we were able to do in Boone County is we had a largest escape in 1853, the Cincinnati 28. It was a successful attempt and they made it up into Canada. What we're doing is now we're looking at all the records post escape. So they escaped in, in 1853. They show up in the Windsor, Ontario census in 1861. And so you look up all the Terrells, all the Parkers, all, all the people uh, with those common last names, and then you start matching them up with ages of the people that we know sought their freedom in 1853. And so then you can track those descendants forward through time, mm -hmm. literally up through the 20th century and into today. So that's something that we can actually do with some of this information that we have here in Gallatin County. So back to uh, 1838, so Lewis Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton. And so what's what's the story on that? Lewis Hamilton. So he was a free person of color. He, um, I believe, lived outside Sparta. Okay. And he was brought to court at the courthouse and accused of being a helper. Okay. And it's one of those stories where it was very common. So would he have been arrested or? He was arrested. Okay, okay. So it wasn't he like, was, could you please show up at the courthouse? It yeah, was, no. It wasn't, it wasn't that friendly. Things were, things were not friendly. Right. So he was ever. taken. He was he was taken into custody, mm -hmm. um, and he was basically brought in front of the judge, uh, most likely also in front of a jury. Of course, not of his peers. He had but he very must, few rights. But he was from. Do you do you believe he was from Gallatin County? Like he, he was, was from probably, Gallatin County. He was probably so well known. He was well known. He was well known. So it's one of those things where. For some reason, and he was fairly young, mm -hmm. so but for some reason he was manumitted. So okay. in your court record somewhere is a manumission paper from who held him probably last and who who gave his freedom. Okay. So um, he he it's likely that he was still employed either by the family or in in some sort of circumstance 
near his family. Would they have written down the reason why or just? No. Okay. You have to speculate. Okay. In, in okay. most cases, it's speculation. And it also depends. I mean, this is, this is hard to talk about. In some cases, so in early records, an African-American person was either described as being black or mulatto. Okay. And mulatto meant that they were of mixed ancestry, right? And uh, many times, manu a manumission would acknowledge that someone was the son or daughter of a slaveholder. Okay. Okay? It's a very hard thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, you can see it in the records all the time that that there were there were circumstances where there were families of mixed mm -hmm. Okay, so likely that could have been the reason that Lewis Hamilton, his last name was Hamilton. Likely he was enslaved by a Hamilton. Um, we could look at will records, wills, and of anyone who, anyone around that time period. Now, if he was listed as a free person of color in 1838, that's pretty early. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty easy to look back in, in the court records and see all the Hamiltons, you basically would look at all the Hamiltons mm -hmm. uh, with wills probably starting about 1830 and seeing that information, see if you can find them. So so, so, so at this point where you start picking up the research is he's at the, the courthouse, he's, he's before at a the judge. Court, he's at the courthouse, he's before a judge. If they're convicted, most likely they're executed okay. or they're sent to the penitentiary. And that early, I don't think they really had too much going on in Frankfurt yet so I think they probably he would have been killed if found guilty if if a white person had been found guilty he would have been fined he would have been jailed he would have been persecuted but he would not have necessarily been the stakes weren't as executed high. correct right. Right. it was very risky many uh, free people of color were helpers in some way the reason why he stayed in the community was most likely he had family relate that he was related to. It was possible. It was quite possible his wife was enslaved. Okay, so that, that it's rough, that, right? That kept him it tied. That's there, the reason why he it, didn't leave. Right, right, right. And most likely he was trying to work to purchase his family's freedom. Okay, and then they would have left. Most, I mean, most likely they would have left. Right. It's, his story is interesting. We haven't found the court records yet mm -hmm. to exactly tell what happened there probably would have been court orders but what's interesting in 1850 he's still living in sparta okay so he was not convicted yeah. which is which is super interesting for him like he must have had a sponsor in the community someone to back him up and say listen this is lewis of course he wasn't helping right and he actually could have been but he had he had someone most likely of wealth and prestige within the community who was able to go to, to literally vouch for him. So he's a very unique case for a number of reasons. He's a very unique case. We had a case up in, in Boone County where someone was accused and openly and they had to leave. Now, they don't they don't go very far. Usually what you'll see happen is if a person is manumitted, they will, and they want to stay close to their family, they move right across the river. So they may have gone to Florence, Indiana, mm -hmm. or Vive, or somewhere close by, mm -hmm. so they could still communicate with, the, with the, their family, which happened all the time. But the fact that he didn't do those things. He stayed. Yeah. He dug in. And so, uh, so as we further look at his story... We want to see who his neighbors were, see if, if if he purchased property, if he was sponsored by someone. Someone had to go with him to the courthouse to help him purchase property. And that is significant because that is a hint as to other white helpers within that Sparta area. We were able to actually find other family members related to him, and um, which is really cool, that... In 1850, we look at David Lillard, and Lillard had two uh, free people of color who were women who were living with him, openly living with his family. And that was uh, Nancy and Mary. Nancy was 70 and uh, Mary was 68 years old. They were likely the relatives of Lewis Hamilton, who was born in 1800. And so they remained in the community as well. So now we're looking at 
it was actually David Lillard who brought the charges against Lewis Hamilton in 1838. But then in 1850, Lillard had two Hamilton women who were likely related to Lewis living in his household as free people of color. It's very complicated. Yeah. Very complicated. It says here the charges were apparently not sustained because Lewis Hamilton was later listed in Gallatin County as a listed as a free black living as a blacksmith living near Sparta, Kentucky with $400 worth of property and a family of seven. So his entire family by then. So if you're manumitted and your wife is manumitted, then your children are born free. So there's a whole story related to that family and related to Sparta that's super interesting. And how does how does David Lillard relate to that? You know, so it gets into the whole complexity of the relationship between the whites and the blacks within Gallatin County, right? There's a whole story behind there. Was there a Baptist church in Sparta? Okay. Does the ba- Baptist church have, if you look at the minute records, if you can find them, for that Baptist church, was Hamilton and the Hamilton family members listed? Was Lillard listed? How did all that come together? More than likely what happened was, this is what I think happened. I think Lewis Hamilton was probably related to the young man who escaped from David Lillard in 1838. It could possibly even been his son, okay, or his brother. The young man escaped, but there was no proof. I, I mean, David Lillard may have been, this, is, this was your son, this was your brother. Of course you helped him. But someone in the community went, David, Mm -hmm. there's literally no evidence that Lewis helped this other young man escape. You have no proof. And, you know, he's he was a he's literally been working within the community. He's he's the town blacksmith. Why are you trying to get rid of our town blacksmith? Right, right, right. right. What are you what are you doing to us? Right. We won't be able to find another one. Right. Right. So so in so that is why that case is so interesting, because it really reflects the complexity of the relationships within this community. So to give some historical kind of concept, I mean, in 1850 is as owning four hundred dollars worth of anything is that a sign of success is that it is okay so he's he he seems like just from what you've been able to find he's small business owner he's he's, he's a small business owner he's, he's got his right? he's doing and, his thing and, and he's doing sparta, well yeah and in sparta they need a blacksmith everybody needs a blacksmith and, and apparently and this is where assumptions are made right. is that he was valued by the community someone he was, pro- was someone valued was protecting him i don't mean that as an no a but, negative, it, but it's true I mean, because if if he wasn't valued, they wouldn't be giving him the business. Right. Right. He wouldn't have his forge and he wouldn't have his equipment. All of that he had to earn. So is, generically, is that atypical for someone to be? It is atypical. OK. It is atypical. Because he, um, he had a trade. He had a trade. He was he was likely when he was when he was enslaved, he was in print. He was apprenticed. OK. Again, most likely within the the Lillard family but I mean we need to look at how Lillard is related to these folks but but yeah so some African Americans were apprenticed in certain ways to have a trade likely someone within the community he was given to someone else in the community or maybe someone in the Hamilton family also had a trade maybe his father when they came from Virginia maybe his father was also a blacksmith and enslaved so there was a lot of other things going on it also though the fact that they valued because he would have had to learn this trade while enslaved he was valued within the family a little bit different which again may look back at his relationship his familial biological relationship to some of those other family members and so all of this kind of starts <sighs> off one small thing in a newspaper or a at, or, or was this covered more i mean was um, this, this was this i found this in the encyclopedia of northern kentucky mm-hmm. but it was yes it was likely a newspaper article Absolutely. Some of this, and it may have been the newspaper articles may be that long, mm-hmm. but then you kind of take those little nuggets and then find more information off of that. And because through your research, you start picking trends like, oh, this is atypical. This right. is, right. this isn't normal. Exactly. And then, and then 
and I, I maybe through Boone. So then there are more, there's communities that are um, more abolitionist. There are. And they grow and feed kind of off of off They of do that. because, you know, you want to be in a community where you're safe. Right. Right. And, and like attracts like. So that's, so that's what we do. So, you know, I think as we move forward in Gallatin County, you know, we're going to start looking at some of those folks that were involved in some of the churches that had more abolitionist leaning like here in warsaw you have some ministers that actually reverend alexander sebastian you had a waller pingree debate baptist versus universalist church in 1850 so you had congregations in this area that supported abolitionist ministers now Overall, did they get run out? Yes. Mm -hmm. But then they literally went across the river into Vivi or um, Florence and then, and then went into the congregations there. So you had people crossing the river every Sunday following some of these ministers. And so, so that's, you look at those numbers and then you look at who is, has properties next to each other. And it may be that they're not exactly in town. They could be at the fringe of town. They could be just like a, like a little unofficial community that no longer exists where they may have had a schoolhouse or the church and then all of those families kind of settled around there. And so to give that kind of historical perspective, the Ohio River was a lot different then too. Yes, it was very narrow. Like, okay, so the reason why it's so wide now is you have the gigantic Markland Dam, mm -hmm. right? Which is literally right outside your community. But back then, you know, flood stage of the Ohio River was like nine feet, mm -hmm. right? So during the winter, it would freeze over. It would be low and it would freeze. So you could walk across it or take a sled across it. And in high summer, it was dry. It was absolutely dry. And it was very narrow. A lot of uh, our river towns that we have in Kentucky at least a portion of those towns are now under the river. So, so, and there was a lot more activity along the river. So, so yeah, so it was super narrow, dry, and it was a lot easier for people to connect with, for Warsaw to connect with the people over in what's now Florence, Indiana. There may have been, the post office may have been in Indiana, you know. The businesses may, that they wanted to go to may have been in Indiana. People went to churches on both sides. There may have been, um, we have a, a situation in, in boom, between Rabbit Hash and Rising Sun where people would come over to pick berries over in in rabbit hash and then and then go ac back across the river to rising sun to live so you saw a lot more a lot that. more activity and you had the free people of color also coming back over here and interacting with their families over here or going to church over here we had an abolitionist she manumitted all of her enslaved and then she lived with them over in rising sun indiana she and one of the former enslaved were members of the Middle Creek Baptist Church in Boone County. They would travel every week to go to church in Boone County. Now, they're abolitionists. They were accepted. It was, it was fine, which leads to you to think, are they also coordinating with the black population that's part of these uh, Baptist churches as well? She'd had an insight that few people had, right? Absolutely. And, and they would have, again... Those, those neighborhood connections. You, she yeah, literally went divisions. back to the neighborhood church, right? So, Which made it also easier, too, in that it wouldn't have been atypical for this white person interacting. Exactly. So, which made it even more rampant. Because, right, right. Because you couldn't just accuse everybody. You could not. Because like if, if you it, ended up on parchment, or the, I mean, the, down the Mississippi... It was stuck out. You're on a plantation or a parchment farm or something like that, or you know whatever. Right, right, really exactly, exactly. Um, and in some cases, the mulatto women were so light skin that it was if you were a stranger, it wasn't necessarily apparent that they were African American. 
in the community you knew that they were African American just because you knew the families and you knew those connections. But if someone from outside, we had Laura Smith Haviland from up in Michigan. She was an activist on the Underground Railroad, but she was absolutely a white woman. And she posed as a free person of color from Rising Sun, a cousin of some sort, who came over and infiltrated a slaveholding farm to try to extract Mm -hmm. an African-American enslaved woman and her family. So these were very light-complected people. And, And so there are a lot of connections amongst these families that are not readily apparent. So is that what makes studying the borderlands so interesting? It is. All right. It's fantastic. Because it's, it's a very murky history. It is a very, it is, it's this mystery, right? And so, and but if you keep pulling these little strings, right, it all unravels and you're like, oh, that's what's going on. Right. But you have to be able to look at individual people to do that. So it takes a lot more research it is. It's very research heavy. The more research you do, the better, more practice you get, um, the easier it becomes. But it's also like eating potato chips too, right? You just can't stop, right? I, I look back at, at the work I did. And I'm like, oh, I got to do so much more right. for Gallatin County because you want to see all of the complexity, right? Mm-hmm. Because you, even after the, the Civil War, you all maintained an African-American free po- a, a population here of former enslaved, right? You, you literally have an African-American cemetery just right outside Warsaw. You know, you have people living in town. So you have all these con- connections. So what does it mean to have all those connections how did everybody relate to one another why were some families tolerated and other families told to get out right away you know i mean it's very complex right and there a lot of that doesn't have written records so you're taking it doesn't so you're taking what you can get but people are people too so there's some there's some there's some prediction yeah Yeah. you have to make some inferences for sure but if you're open-minded to just see where it goes and how it develops i think more becomes apparent right if you go oh so and so was part of this congregation oh that was led by an abolitionist oh they started going to church across the way okay yeah, okay. because you, and oh, where was their property? Oh, their property was there in Sparta. Oh, okay, I understand now. So yeah, you typically wouldn't an abolition and anti-abolition would not be. Um, what, actually, they could be family members. But they would they typically be going to the same church? Or was that usually? Was that mm-hmm. kind of the dividing line typically on that? It was. It was a dividing. I mean, there was okay. It depends. Right. Right. <laughs> All of it. Right. All it of this depends. depends yeah. It depends on family. Mm-hmm. Right, because you literally could have slaveholders with anti-slavery people in the same, like literally brothers or cousins or nephews or however, and they could be a part of the same church, at least for a while, Mm -hmm. because you still had to, the abolitionists still had a function within the society around them. You know, if you completely reject the society of what was Gallatin County, you were going to Indiana, right? You, If you chose to function within this environment, there were some things that you had to accept as reality within your family, within your friends group, whatever, right? If you had a business, if you ran a ferry, mm-hmm. okay, you weren't going to be outwardly abolitionist, even if you were, because people would suspect you and then they wouldn't use your ferry service. Well, just kind of the story you're saying about um, Lewis Hamilton. How much? Exactly. How much did that probably take away, take out of his life in 1838 to get you know brought before a judge? Right. With it the, was with the threat of death. I mean, with the threat of death, and then who's going to support his family? Mm-hmm. So that was the thing you have to to know. You could be open abolitionist, but you weren't. You nobody you nobody could suspect that you were helping with the Underground Railroad mm-hmm. because you would lose everything. Well, not only that, you'd, you'd be watched constantly. So you, you'd be watched constantly. You wouldn't be any good to the Underground Railroad anyway you because not. you're more dangerous at that point. You would not. You would not. We had, an, and we had um, one particular case, and I think this is super important 
many of the helpers were all other enslaved African Americans. And I, I suspect you had a lot of that going on in this county where you had enslaved people who did not were motivated to not leave their families. It happened all the time. The families were used as a way to keep you anchored into this community. And so what you would do though is you would stay enslaved to be close to your family because you didn't want to risk that. But you were also a helper. So you communicated with the Laura Smith Havilands from Michigan. You communicated with the river boats that were um, uh, that were also had other helpers, African American helpers on them. And and so when somebody stopped, so you were a messenger and you would you maybe give messages across the river. We have someone hiding in the woods. They're going to need help. And then somebody lights a candle or lights a lantern or plays plays a fiddle, something right that helps lead that person to let them know that that the slave catchers and the patrollers are not on this part of the river this night you know i mean these rivers were so narrow you literally could hear conversations from across the river these were intimate relationships that we had so you know everything had to be very well planned out and and so the help of other enslaved people was essential and so how good would they have to be at knowing who to trust and when to trust it. I mean, very good. I mean, just very, very, very good. There, there, there have been cases where because they also knew to watch Windsor, the the Detroit Windsor Crossing, right, mm -hmm. um, up in Canada, and there would be people who knew the names that were from this area who would be hired to go up there and watch and wait. So they would have the information on who they're looking for. And they couldn't necessarily just go and accost mm -hmm. someone who's seeking freedom across to Canada. But what they could do is they could try to trick them to come back. Oh, they're not really in trouble. You're not really in trouble. You, but you don't have to go all the way to Canada. You don't have to go across on the boat. Let's let's go ahead and find you some work in Ohio. Or let's find you some work in, in Michigan or Indiana. Or, you know everything is okay i'm a friend and they know all the names but they're not really friends so it was very hard to know who to trust yeah. i i don't understand how they did it and were successful and and the bravery it took to be able to do everything that they did yeah, e well even even the bravery in those who stayed right like that's yeah, well i mean and that's, that's just, the thing yeah. because if if you're enslaved and you're caught helping with the underground railroad you're done you're getting sold down south Getting sold down river was an actual thing for this region. And if you were sold to one of the large pl plantations, you were done. Your life was over. Because um, you were completely isolated once you're on those large plantations. You are. Too. And in a lot of cases, those large plantations were owned by relatives of the people who lived up here. Okay. So they would have their small family farms up here, but maybe they own a big plantation out, out west like missouri or whatever or mississippi or louisiana something like that but that experience was just so different than too the culture between it was completely different and brutal and right. life up here was bad no right. one wants to be enslaved right right ever but it was a different reality it was a completely different reality bridget i think that that's a good starting point for our first one on oh, this one. I hope so. But Lewis Hamilton's really interesting story, though. He is I, really I just interesting. Just want there's more. A, there's more to. It's a complex thing. I want to know. I want to know if his done. kids became blacksmiths. I want to know. Exactly. Oh, I want the whole family. Where I they went too. Yeah. Wow. You know? That's really cool. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me.